images of God in Job. I'm not going to assume that uh, you know anything about the book of Job, so I will assume no previous knowledge of the book or even any previous knowledge of the Bible. So we're all going to start on the same level here. By way of introduction, I want to tell you a story about uh, Teresa of Avila. I don't know a whole lot of things about her, but this is something that always stood out and uh, really made me fall in love with a woman. Just a, a marvelous story. She, she's old, she's well-established, rather influential in the church, and she's traveling through Spain to start a new convent somewhere. And it's on a floodplain. And her wagon has been put on a ferry, some kind of a little pontoon boat. And as it's crossing the water, something goes wrong and the wagon falls into the water and she almost drowns and they drag her sputtering and wet I, I just imagine this uh, little wiry old lady all wet and all upset and all angry and they pull her out of the water and the way the story goes God told her this is the way I treat my friends this poor lady she's sitting there cold and wet and old and sick and she almost lost her life. And God says, this is the way I treat my friends. And with her characteristic humor, she turns back to God and says, and that's why you have so few of them. I love that story. I love the, the humor in that story. But it's, it's humor with a little kick to it. Because after you laugh a little bit, you think to yourself, is it true? Is that really the way God treats our friends, his friends? And the answer I want to present is, is, yeah, that is true. That is the way God treats his friends. At least we can say that in many cases, the righteous, the wise, and the innocent suffer inordinately in this world. There's something twisted at the very heart, at the very fabric of the universe, that, that, that the nice people don't have things work out the way they should. That's the way God treats his friends. What sort of a God is this who treats his friends thusly? Well, the book of Job is a story of another one of God's friends. And Job also suffered far beyond the degree that he might have, by any stretch of the imagination, deserved such suffering. So what I want us to look at tonight is the book of Job. And the question we want to address, the question we want to ask of the book of Job is, what sort of God is pictured in this book? What sort of God is it who treats his friends in such a way. I'm told that uh, everybody loves outlines, so I'm going to give you kind of the structure of what we're going to do tonight. First, I'm going to talk about the content of the book of Job. What, what, what is there in this book that we are going to be understanding tonight? So the first part of the talk is going to be the content of the book of Job. Then, very briefly, I want to discuss the theological implications of images of God, descriptions of God. And that's going to be real brief. And uh, finally, I'm going to discuss in turn four of what I consider the major images or pictures of God that's presented in the book. I'll wrap it up with uh, a short discussion of some of the implications and some of my responses to the material as I presented it. Okay, so now you know where I'm going. You'll know how close I am to the end. The book of Job can be divided into a series of scenes, if you could imagine scenes like movie scenes, where, where uh, different blocks of material are, are really distinct and apart and different from each other. So I want to go over the book of Job as a succession of scenes. The first scene takes place in two areas. It takes place both in heaven and on earth. Scene one, in heaven and on earth. Uh, scene one in heaven concerns a discussion between God and the Satan. And I'm saying the Satan. I'll explain why shortly. 
a discussion between God and the Satan concerning the righteousness of Job. God says to the Satan, take a look at my servant Job. He's perfect and upright. He, he fears God and he avoids all kinds of evil. Have you ever seen such a guy as that? And the Satan responds to God and says, big deal. What is the merit of somebody serving God only for what he gets? So the Satan accused Job of only serving God for what he can get out of it. Scene one then shifts to earth. Because you see, a wager has taken place. The Satan has bet God that if Job is afflicted, if Job suffers, if Job loses the benefits of serving God, he'll throw the whole thing out the window. And God says, you're on. So they have a bed, and then the scene shifts to earth when everything bad happens to Job. First, I mean, Job is a wealthy guy, very well respected in the community, powerful, influential. He loses in a series of freak accidents all his property, all his cattle, all his livestock, all his stored grain, everything he has, gone. And as soon as he hears this news, successively, one messenger after another, telling him about a different disaster in a different corner of his plantation, then he gets the final news. All of his children, seven sons, three daughters, were in a house. And a wind blew against the house. The house fell down. All of his kids are dead. He falls to the ground in mourning. But he doesn't do what the Satan said he would do. Instead of cursing God, he blesses God. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, he says. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The scene then shifts to heaven. We're still in the first scene now. And the Satan appears before God again. And God just kind of, you can see him poking the Satan in the ribs and saying, look at this, look at this. I did all these things to my servant Job, and he still praises me. Pay up. The Satan says, big deal. Big deal. You've done everything to him but the most important thing. You have not touched his body. You haven't made him sick. So they make a new wager. God says, you're on. And Satan goes down and gives Job the most horribly dis figuring and suffering disease that you could ever imagine. He's covered from head to toe with painful, itching, oozing boils. There's no place he could sit. There's no place he could be comfortable. And he sits down on the ground and still he refuses to curse God. He says, we receive good things from God. We'll have to receive bad things from him as well. And that's the end of the first scene. 